All right, we're streaming, Bano. Um, I'm just gonna double check on my Facebook page to confirm that we are live. Since I am, it's not showing up. Um, Bano, kia ora, here we are, we're live um, on the main Green Party page. Um, kia ora everybody and welcome to our seminar on um, how to do a submission for the um, migrant exploitation inquiry. Um, I'll just give it um, 30 more seconds um, for people to tune in. Um, and we're joined by Anu Kalotti um, from the Migrant Workers Association. Kia ora, Anu. Kia ora. Sweet. So as people join, um, if you want to leave a comment on the Facebook page um, or send us a question, um, feel free to do so, but we'll get formally started. And I'll just open us up with um, Takotoki, um, which is Matatini Mamano Karapa Tefai, which um, means by many, by thousands, the work will be accomplished. Um, so yeah, kia ora everybody. Um, Ricardo here, listening to for the Green Party and immigration spokesperson um, based in the sunny and summery Tamaki Makoto today. Um, and I'll um, pass on to you, Anu, to briefly introduce yourself. So, yeah, thanks, Ricardo. Um, um, hello, everybody. Welcome. And thanks to Ricardo and the Greens for organizing today's session. Uh, I am Anu Koloshi, president of Migrant Workers Association. And as I'm sure most of you will know that um, over the last 10 or so years, we've been actively uh, supporting our migrant workers and um, fighting against uh, exploitation of our migrant workers and lobbying the government, um, previous one and the current one at the same time to um, actually get some meaningful positive policy change so that we don't have to keep fighting exploitation of our migrant workers for the rest of our lives. Um, so um, that kind of brings me on to the, the submissions and the public consultation that takes place every time that the governments want to change policy. Um, so it's a, in, in the last year or two years, we've seen um, many of you actually um, participate in, in that process. And it's, it's very, very heartening and encouraging to see that. Um, so I think yeah, um, Ricardo and, and we at Migrant Workers Association, we kind of felt that, you know, we, we could all do with a little bit of support and, and few tips on how to make better and, and more effective, efficient submissions. So hence today's workshop. So I, I'm looking forward to, um, uh, to be able to contribute and, and to learn um, these things as well. Yeah, and I mean, Anu's been at the front lines for Quite a few years now doing this mahi. I mean, I remember joining some of the protests the Migrant Work Association organized since before being an MP. But it just sort of speaks to the issue of um, migrant exploitation being something that we've been trying to tackle for quite some time. And so um, we we know that, for example, in the in, in the past, while complaints on like um, exploitation have gone up by quite a bit. And um, as an MP, I get harrowing um, stories coming through um, of people who are on employer-bound visas or who may be um, on a working holiday visa on really precarious situations, especially at the moment with um, COVID. And, and so, you know, migrant exploitation can have many faces, um, whether it's people knowing that you're situation in Aotearoa New Zealand is based on your employer keeping you um, and therefore you you accepting horrible conditions because you're kind of holding up for that residency it can also look like um, you know and then it can transform into normal, the exploitation we see um, in, in, in locally um, which is things like um, wage theft or um, people's hours not being reflected or just abuse in the workplace more broadly, um, which Anu can, I'll, I'll get in to speak on some of the experiences that, that she's seen on the ground. But I'll just briefly introduce the inquiry, um, which is being led by the Education and Workforce um, Select Committee. So they, the for those of you who may not know, the parliament has select committees and their role is to scrutinize um, the, the legislation that comes through us and also to, um, 
to do investigations and inquiries on different issues. So we've, we've chosen to do one on migrant worker exploitation. Um, we'll be um, taking in written submissions and oral submissions. And so today's purpose is to help you um, put up a really good written submission and give you some tips on, on also how to present if you choose to do an oral submission. Um, the inquiry will be looking at quite a few things. Um, so it's looking at things like um, the impact of exploitation on migrant workers and their families, what can be done to address these impacts, things like what are the conditions that are leading uh, migrant workers being exploited, um, uh, what future powers, if any, uh, should be given to the labor inspectorate, um, what, for example, like government processes um, and how they impact exploitation. And so, um, and also things like what is stopping our communities from coming through and, and reporting it. So it's pretty broad. And, and that means that um, you as a migrant or as somebody who may know somebody who's a migrant worker, um, you can speak to um, the, the broad issue of exploitation. So we're encouraging people who've been exploited to, to submit, um, but also if you're a supporter of our communities, if, if, you, if you know somebody who's been exploited, um, we also welcome people's um, um, reckons and and um, you know contributions as to uh, how they think migrant exploitation is occurring in New Zealand because um, we know that um, co-workers may have seen it happen and it's important that um, you also speak up. Um, so the the influence of submissions is really powerful by the way people often ask you know can can I as an individual change things and policies and I would say that um, it, it can and it's all part of the the you know the toolbox um, I knew herself um, had a petition that she did to parliament and she had to do um, written and oral submissions um, and so that 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 contributed to um, the pressure on the government to release the R21 visa and we recently had really powerful submitters um, speaking against the discrimination that disabled people face when it comes to immigration setting which resulted in the committee recommending the government to review those rules which is a really powerful recommendation so there is the potential that this inquiry could lead to some really powerful recommendations like decoupling work visas from single employers, which is something a lot of us have been fighting on for quite some time on top of other stuff, right? Um, I, I wanted to just go back to Anu and, and Anu, I'd be great to just get your perspective on, you know, with exploitation, like what have you been seeing on the ground um, in, uh, over the past, you know, um, few years? And, and what do you think, you know, the situation with exploitation is right now in New Zealand? So, um, yeah, what does exploitation look like? It, um, I'll have to summarize and condense uh, in, uh, yeah, in a short space. Um, so anything from um, people being made to work additional hours, uh, in additional to whatever they have signed up for in their employment agreement, but not being paid for that. Uh, people not being given their rest breaks, their meal breaks, um, people um, forced to work while they're sick. They're not, not allowed sick leave. Um, I mean, all, all these things are unlawful. You know, they, they are minimum entitlements that um, workers uh, are allowed um, under New Zealand employment law. Uh, and um, people um, asked for cash back. Um, so, you know, we routinely seen where um, everything looks picture perfect on a paper trail, like in, in bank accounts on IRD summaries, but then um, those workers are being asked to hand cash back on a weekly basis. Now that again is very sophisticated of anything from actually drawing money out at an ATM, giving it to your boss, to um, doing grocery shopping for your boss or, or depositing money into um, friends of, of the boss so that you know it can't be tracked and traced easily. Um, employers charging um, tens of thousands of dollars up front, even before somebody starts working for them. Uh, that's considered um, a premium for support with their visa application. Uh, we have seen um, threats, um, you know, physical, verbal, psychological abuse, where, you know, it's quite common for uh, our migrant workers to be threatened with, uh, you know, if, if you don't do X, Y, Z, I will have your visa canceled and then I'll have you deported back to your home country. Um, we have seen um, where um, couples, so husband and wife, um, 
one of them would have the visa sponsored by the employer and everything is good for them. They paid properly, they paid overtime, but the other partner is made to work for free, you know, where um, employers own more than one business. So that, that's been quite commonplace, unfortunately, something that I call um, two for the price of one, you know, it makes it sound like some offer at some shop or what have you. Um, what else have we seen? Uh, the, the most severe uh, where, you know, their passports may be confiscated and then held by the employer, uh, where um, people actually physically bound in a space um, where, by, you know, the employer is providing accommodation for their migrant workers, but those workers are actually as good as being imprisoned, you know, that they they don't have their passports, they're not allowed to leave that physical space. Um, they may have to seek permission even to go out on, on their day off. Um, people working seven days without any break. Um, and finally, when people do pick up the courage to, to leave and you know, go on to another job, and that they're, they're not uh, given all of their entitlements in that final pay, so they won't be paid out for their annual leave, for example, uh, or any other um, payments they may have owing to them. Um, we've also had where um, migrant workers have been brave enough to report the matter to authorities, to MBIE or to um, workers associations like ourselves. Uh, and, and, and if the employer gets wind of that, then the situation just becomes worse, you know, the, the threat become more severe. Um, we've had um, employees accused of theft. That usually happens once uh, a complaint has been made to the authorities. Or, or to uh, an employment advocate or to a union that the worker belongs to, then the employer starts making up stories about, you know, they, they've stolen this, they've done that. Um, so yeah, that, that hopefully gives um, people a, a, a picture of what's, what's going on. And I think the other part that you asked was, you know, why, why is it happening? Um, so this largely happens where visas are tied to the employers uh, and those uh, employer supported visas that we had more than one before, but at the moment there's just the essential skills work visa, I guess, largely. Um, so um, our migrant workers are tied to uh, an employer to a specific location um, so that they, you know, they, they can't leave if, if they do their visa that they're in breach of their visa conditions and so that is the root cause um, but we also see exploitation where the visas are not tied you know for example students who have work rights you know they can go and work for anyone uh, or partners of work visa holders you know that they have open visas but they um, do also get exploited unfortunately and that is because the employers the, the carrot that they dangle is you know if you keep putting up with your exploitation, I will then support you for your next visa or for your residence visa. So the, our entire immigration settings are kind of um, largely set up in a way where employers have all the power and then they have the ability to exploit our vulnerable migrant workers. Mm. Thank you. And, and, and just noting this, I see some comments and questions coming through the chat. Thank you. I will go through those in a second, so keep them coming. Um, um, before I go into those, though, um, I think, you know, Anu's given some really clear examples of um, exploitative situation. I just want to, and like Anu said, it's, it's a range, right? So it's from the little things like the, the bullying that comes from a power imbalance where people know that your future ha hangs on your visa to um, incredibly exploitative stuff that you can only really get away with doing to a migrant because of the, you know, um, conditions that comes with having an employer bound visa, for example. And, and so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it occurs on a spectrum. Um, and so in order to effectively communicate your experiences or um, your support towards ending exploitation um, in, in a submission, I wanted to sort of communicate a few tips because I think especially especially for our migrant communities, many who may come from um, democracies where public submissions may not even be a common thing or may sometimes be an exercise in the theater of pretending that politicians are gonna listen to you but they don't actually listen to you. I think it's important that, that um, we speak to um, how to make an effective submission but what it would entail. And so first of all, I want to, um, give the disclaimer that if you want to give a private submission or if you're given information that is sensitive um 
you can let the committee know. Um, for those in the Zoom, um, a link to the submission uh, uh, portal has been put by, um, by someone from our team and, um, and we'll put it on the Facebook uh, Live as well. But that's important to know because I, I know several of you who are joining, you know, um, you've gone through really harrowing stuff and, and you don't necessarily want to present publicly um, to a group of MPs where the world can see you talking um, about the conditions you experience for many reasons. So that's something I just want to let, let you know. Secondly, I guess the thing I want to communicate first and foremost is that the, um, in terms of what makes an effective submission is to speak from your heart and to be succinct. I used to be really intimidated about making a submission when I, uh, before I became an MP, I, I thought it was the kind of thing that only high, highly paid researchers would do. Um, and now that I've become an MP and I sometimes hear some of the awful conservative takes <laughs> that reach parliament, I sometimes think, damn, I wish I had the confidence of these people and, and that, I, that I had the confidence before being an MP to, to sort of just go in there and, and give my contribution to pieces of legislation and inquiries, right? So um, su submissions into this inquiry do not need to be um, super researched, you know, cite um, pieces with citations. It's, it's more about your personal experience. They also don't need to be um, a massive essay, right? It's about the, 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 the way in which you can summarize your experience in New Zealand. Um, so it can be a page or two pages long if you want. And, and, and I think if you have a recommendation to make to parliament, like something you would like to see change, I almost recommend starting with that and ending with that and then sandwiching your personal story in between, right? So for example, I mean, I think of my time when I was on a temporary visa, I, I, I was never on an employer bound visa, but, um, but I think of um, my own experience in hospitality and I wish, for example, that, um, somebody had told me that changing your hours really aggressively, for example, in your roster, um, like in order to try and face you out was illegal effectively. <laughs> like, and so, you know, if I was given my a submission on my experience, I probably would want to give, you know, a recommendation um, around, uh, you know, having, uh, union membership being something that is automatic and I think that would have helped me a lot and then I would have talked about why um, my experience would have meant you know automatic union membership would have been helpful for some people um, who had employer-bound visas um, talking about why decoupling them is important and then speaking as to your experience that could be something you can do and and maybe I knew um, you know and you've made some submissions to parliament like how did you find the process of making the submissions you've done so far and, and what think what do you think made you know effective submissions for your petition that eventually help get the R221 visa through? Yep. So um, a few years ago when I first started, it, it was quite daunting as well. And and I didn't know any MPs who sat on those select committees. So I kind of didn't really have a guide, but I, I did work with like, for example, Unite Union and um, another one or two immigration lawyers. So we, we worked as a group, which was really helpful. So we, we wrote um, from the heart, like you said, I think that is the best if, if we write what we think, because so sometimes there may not be a right or wrong way. So to, to make a start, I think it's a, it's a good idea just, just to put down on paper, whatever you've got in your head and then fine tune that. I think that's how I first started out in my first submission. I had two other people writing alongside. One of them was extremely experienced um, uh, from Unite Union, and he, he's been ex Mike Treen, I might as well tell you. You know, he, he, he writes backed with statistics data, and, and first time around, that was very intimidating. And I was like, I'm writing alongside someone who writes perfectly and has all the research and everything so I was like okay what do I write it, it was I was scared I was nervous but I, I I put I wrote very little compared to the other two but I I wrote from my experience what I had come across meeting all different migrants who'd been exploited um so then over the years the subsequent submissions I think I I got better at it and uh, and also um with um, being involved in more campaigns 
and and sort of you know getting smaller victories and then bigger victories you you, you learn and and you and also doing media helps you know you kind of learn to pitch things so now when i read the proposal or the the consultation policy paper that is released by parliament when i read it i i try to highlight the the main points you know what are they really asking here so instead of like focusing on every single sentence in there i usually highlight okay these are the main crunch points and and how can i answer or contribute to those points based on what i have experienced so um yeah it's, it's very important that at the end of I, I've learned something new that you're saying that also at the beginning, if you set the tone, okay, this is what you're asking for. So that's really important. Like, you know, beginning and end, you're giving them a message like, this is what we want to see change. This is what we want to see happen. Um, so I, I don't write really long, like detailed um, uh, submissions. I, I try to keep them sort of succinct and brief. Uh, and the other thing I learned recently or about two years ago, from before I made my last submission from, from one of the MPs in the select committee, I, I won't name them because I, I don't want to kind of compromise people. They, they said that what members on the select committees like to really hear is like sort of case studies, real life stories. So that was something really useful for me that, you know, whatever I'm saying, whatever I'm claiming, if I can back it up with real life facts, with incidents, with human stories basically you know that that's what kind of appeals to people you know that that's very touching so and that's been quite big in, in in my submissions now and i was going to say obviously for this inquiry the benefit is that many of you submitting probably have had first-hand experience yeah. of exploitation right so you can lean on that for those of you who may not have first-hand experience but want to support the community i recommend typing um on your favorite news outlet literally exploitation migrant and you will yeah. get to read Hundreds. plenty of stories to get a sense of some of the more high profile cases that which will give you an indication of what happens more broadly right and so i think you can also lean on the stories you've you've seen in the news of exploitation um and yeah i think like i i, I wanted to say because you you talked also about making an oral submission and so for those of you who've never done one when you put in in your submission in writing it's it's important to a you know state the sort of changes you would like to see state your experience if you don't have a recommendation for government your experience is more than enough um and 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 the other thing that it's important to um state is whether you would like to do an oral submission mm -hmm. so you will have the opportunity to potentially present to the mps very like orally which allows for questions and answers from the mps and i think that's a really really useful moment because it allows you to perhaps if um you felt like you needed to explain the situation you went through more thoroughly you know this that opportunity can can be really useful and then you also get a bit of a sense of knowing where other mps are at on this issue um which which can then identify you know what are the political parties we, you may need to pressure or to sort of um, continue advocating um, to make changes on. And, and hearing other people's oral submissions can be a really good way to also practice for yours, because then you can find out how, how it all works. So um, on the parliament website, if you um, type, Anu, if you type parliament, Anu Kalotti, um, Pathways to Residency, you probably will be able to see Anu's um, oral submission, which, you know, <laughs> putting you on the spot here a little bit, but I do think, example of somebody from a migrant community actually doing a, an oral presentation in parliament and going through the motions of being asked questions and answering on on, on an issue um again if if you have really sensitive and private stuff that you would like to speak to um you know orally in front of the committee you can let the committee know and in the on the um online portal you will be given that option so there's always the opportunity to hear people um orally in a in a way that is private and doesn't get um you know publicized and so especially on this issue again um very likely many of you will be in a situation where you probably won't want to make an oral presentation public um and so i i highly encourage you to to consider that option 
I know I thought maybe yeah you... very, very quickly on oral submissions because it's also timed like in a time frame you're given 10 minutes or whatever so I, I feel a lot of pressure when I have a lot of things to explain and I'm now time bound that kind of freaks me out every time even now with years of experience it freaks me out because I don't want to miss anything out and I don't want to be going on and on about something that's not too relevant so what I do is I make notes beforehand so I, I reread this, the written submission that I had made. I go and read it again to refresh. And then I just jot main bullet points down. And, and, I, and also sometimes it's easy to like forget about the notes you've made when you were talking in an oral submission. So I kind of make a point of like going, keep going back to my notepad and keep you know, sort of crossing out things I've already said. So yeah, to, to stay within that time limit and still cover everything that you think is important. And, and I was just, that's, those are all perfect and great examples. I also want to reiterate, I still get nervous when I do speeches in parliament. So like, don't, like, what I'm trying to convey is that, you know, don't feel too intimidated by this, the space, um, because it is your space to claim and to speak on issues. I think Anna's points on like bullet points and notes are really important and also um, normally people will be given five minutes to present orally. So I, I cannot emphasize more than I know has in terms of the importance of being succinct and what you want to communicate. And if you are considering doing an oral submission, I really recommend even um, doing it, you know, in two to three minutes to then allow some questions for from the MPs. Because I think it's often when you get that conversation, the back and forth between the MP and, and, and yourself that I think, um, it's where you can change hearts and minds of the MPs and you can kind of really um, get us to see the human side of things. And so um, I yeah, just want to sort of say it's if, if you can think of making your case in three minutes, uh, <laughs> you know, even better, which which means those bullet points are really important so that yeah. you stick to the key points that you're yeah. you want to make. Nothing wrong with reading it out loud. And then lastly, um, I think it's a good thing when the MPs ask you questions. So I, I know some people can get yeah, nervous of that as well. Oh my God, what are they going to ask me and how will I answer? But if they're asking you questions, that means they've been paying attention to what you've said and you've delivered your message really effectively and clearly. So it's a positive thing that they ask you for the questions. So yeah, we should be happy that they're asking questions. I've just had a question from, um, from the team which I think it's a prompt for, for me, but um, when a person makes an oral submission, can they have a support person with them? Um, if, yes, if you're physically in parliament, you can bring um, support people with you to, to do it. You can do some um, oral submissions over Zoom or even the phone. So if you're doing over Zoom, for example, you can have a family member next to you, um, potentially just outside of the, the frame of the screen, but, if it, but yes, you can have somebody there to support you, um, which, which I think can be um, really helpful. I think also with language barriers, you know, I this is why I, especially if English is your second language, um, really recommend having, um, you know, things written down so that you can uh, read them out if you need to, which I think is really helpful if, if um, you're kind of feeling like, oh, am I gonna not sound the way I wanna sound? Um, and, and, and so having it, again, just reiterating the points around the, the, the bullet points that Anu said earlier. I thought, Anu, um, we can spend the next bit, unless you've got more tips, just addressing some of the comments and questions that have gone through the chat. So I can just read them out loud and we can just speak to them, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. And um, team, if you're joining us <laughs> via, um, via Zoom, feel free to leave a comment. I'll try to check in the, the ones on the Facebook live stream. Um, I won't name you people who've made, made it, just in case you wanna sort of keep it um, anonymous. So we've gotten a comment from somebody saying, um, the question is, if you're appointed as an acting manager with added responsibilities and you don't get paid a higher pay scale in recognition of the added responsibilities, isn't that immigrant exploitation um, as well? So basically the question is, if you're appointed in a new role, for example, acting manager with added responsibilities and you don't get paid a higher scale in recognition of your added responsibilities, would you consider that exploitation, Anu? Uh, kind of, yeah. So if, you know, the employer should have discussed it with you and offered you, like, you know, if, if you've been given added responsibilities, the right way to do it is for the employer to update your employment agreement. 
and give you a new job description. And in that, your remuneration um, should also have changed if you've got additional responsibilities. So um, yeah, if they're not doing that, you have a right to um, raise a grievance with your employer. Um, so before I guess you go and make a complaint of full-blown migrant exploitation, I would advise that you go through the grievance process and, and see what you get, what you achieve. And I would also advise that you document it all rather than just verbal conversations. I and mean, you can still discuss verbally, but back it up with emails, messages, and what have you, so that you've got evidence. So hmm. uh, yeah, you know, I, I'm just giving the employer the benefit of the doubt in case they've overlooked. <laughs> so, you know, just give them that one opportunity first, and if it, yeah, still, uh, uh, you know, if they don't um, come to party or they you're not heard, your grievance is not heard properly, then you've got other avenues that you can pursue. And I think for the purpose of the inquiry, I really recommend also, I mean, if you're in a situation like this and you may have felt that perhaps um, you felt the employer got around not changing your job description, maybe because of the language barrier, maybe because of um, just cultural clashes. Like if, if, if there was anything along those lines, I, I would sort of really note it for the purpose of a submission because I think it's often again, exploitation, I think, starts with that power imbalance that people find themselves in. And so sometimes, yeah, people assume they can get away with doing things to our communities because maybe our English isn't great or because we're on a temporary visa, right? And so, um, yeah, for the example, I, you know, Anu's suggesting giving a bit of benefit of the doubt, sort of race it, um, take it through the grievance process. But if, um, but I, I still think you may want, if you're thinking of that as an experience to lean on for the inquiry, I um, really recommend sort of speaking to um, perhaps how you felt when this role was offered to you, like whether you felt that because you're in a temporary visa, maybe that played a role on you not being put on a higher scale, it may, pay scale. If you've seen other people in, in your industry or in um, the company, for example, being given a higher pay scale, that can be something that you can sort of raise. And I, I can also understand if many of our migrant workers would feel afraid to raise that grievance with the employer. So, you know, that, that's, yeah, that, it is exploitation because, you know, the visa is tight. They don't want to jeopardize anything. So, yeah, mm. we fully mm. understand. So, yeah, it's absolutely appropriate to yeah raise these kinds of examples in the submission. So we've also got a comment um, around some of the... Um, issues happening around indirect exploitation. Um, so the comment reads, um, there's a lot of indirect exploitation that has been overlooked. For example, um, I have been the victim of bullying, but when I complained to the Employment Authority, Religion Authority, I have not been supported in getting the renewal of my visa that made me vulnerable to be deported from the country. But when I looked for help for migrant exploitation, I did not get any help. So I guess this is like um, lack of support in relationship to complaints made to the Employment Relation Authority. And I guess this is why the inquiry touches on, for example, resourcing to different entities, including also the Labor Inspectorate as well. So I think that's quite important. If you didn't feel supported when you were racing it with the Employment Author uh, Relation Authority, I would recommend, you know, addressing that as part of the, the journey that you may have gone through in exploitation. I don't know if you've got any points around that. Uh, yeah, so that space, MBIE, um, employment um, sort of services, mediations, uh, uh, that's a little bit easier to navigate for a layperson. But when matters get into employment relation authority, it becomes very technical and it's, it's, it's difficult for a layperson, for a migrant workers to um, yeah, navigate that space. So that's where you actually need employment advocates or your union organizers to be supporting you. Uh, it's it's very, um, it's bureaucratic and, and it's very black and white, you know, they, yeah, it's almost like INZ, they will only accept things in certain ways. So that space does need to be improved and, and there is such a backlog because, you know, of the, yeah, there's not enough resource in, in these um, government agencies and departments. So that, that is a problem and it, it, that needs to be raised in the submissions big time. And, you know, people are waiting two, three years easily um, for, um, you know, so, so by, by the time uh, Employment Relation Authority has heard the matter and they've made an order, a determination, 
um, employers have more often than not either liquidated their businesses or gone bankrupt or already transferred their assets into something else. So our workers are left with not a lot. So yeah, that, that needs to feature in the submissions quite a lot. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, for, for the person who put that comment, yeah, there's a good there's a good nudge from Manu to um to highlight it and others who may have gone through it. I'm just gonna skip to a comment a little bit of the lower down, just I, I think that's a really important one to highlight. It asks, um, while making a written submission, is it okay to add evidences and yet keep it anonymous? If you've got evidence that you feel will incriminate another party or um, you know, with the, or that the issue of natural justice may come into place, um, or that it's sensitive, let the committee, or, well, it's the, let the clerk know, which is the, the group that runs the committee. Um, so for example, if you feel like you were exploited and uh, maybe you've got some text messages you received or emails that you received from your employer, which are abusive, for example, um, and you wanna sort of present those to the committee, like that's the kind of stuff I really recommend discussing, discussing with the clerk. Um, because there are ways in which you could potentially lodge that secret evidence um, and, 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 and discuss doing that, or potentially you may be advised to sort of um, maybe speak to the issue more generally without sort of um, bringing issues of um, natural justice into, into the forum. So, um, but, but if you think that, you know, for example, in, um, the evidence if you've got a piece of evidence that really, really sort of um, speaks to exploitation and the changes you want to make, and you feel like you cannot make your point without presenting that evidence, then that's when I recommend you sort of um, really uh, having that conversation with the clerk. And, and in the portal that Sharon has been putting on the chat, um, there's a note about that. And you can, as you go through making your submission um, in that um, portal, then um, you'll be able to, to ex expect, yeah, just, um, address that if it needs to be. I'll just go through another one briefly, which is, um, it says, my employer asked me to take cash back to him and extra money for supporting my PR application. He also told Immigration New Zealand that my character is bad in order to let me and my family leave New Zealand ASAP. Now my visa will expire really soon. Um, and, and talking about needing um, our support. Um, also, I, understand you've emailed me so I will have a I will just double check that we've got in your email and reply but I knew I mean that seems to me like a really clear example of yeah. the issue around asking for money you know yeah. and so, for supporting their PR application yeah so that, that that's unlawful for an employer to do that so I would highly recommend that this person report um, their exploitation to MBIE there's the the new unit I think the number is 0800 200.088 or you can search online just google search report exploitation and you'll go to the employment nz website there's a phone number you phone them and you report your exploitation and um they will then it usually takes a few days they will come back they'll interview you you can ask for an interpreter if, if english is your second language for, for the interview and um if, if that unit within mbi is is absolutely convinced that you've been exploited they will issue you um an ass assessment report saying that you've been exploited and using that letter you can apply for the migrant exploitation protection work visa uh, that again inz um, does not have an application fee for that visa and um, they will issue you a six month open work visa so that you can then go and work yeah you can leave your exploitative situation so um and the um uh, the labor inspectors may also then investigate <clears throat> your employer. So you will need to provide your evidence to the labor inspectors should they want to uh, investigate further. Hmm. Thank you. That's useful advice as well in the short term. And I think, um, I think you know, that experience really speaks to when it comes to employer bound visas, to the power dynamics that it creates. And so, you know, yes, we do have the migrant exploitation um, visa that um, Anu spoke about, but I think, you know, we do have the opportunity to get that feedback through about the, you know, sources of where exploitation starts, which is those employer bound conditions. I mean, it's great that we've got now a visa to support some of the people because not everyone yeah. who's exploited will qualify for it, but yeah. it'd be great if we obviously manage to stop exploitation from even or putting people in situations yes. where exploitation happens in the first place. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, so this new visa is is just temporary minor relief. It doesn't actually address the actual um, root cause, but it, it's welcome. It's, it's relief, but we yeah, it's yeah. fine. 
for the time being. I, I agree. Um, we've had a comment just about, um, sorry, just scrolling back up to read it properly. Oh, just um, adjacent related, but not to the exploitation inquiry, just about family reunification and the border reopening um, and that it's been two years. Just wanna, yeah, give a shout out to those split families for joining us today and, and the call about um, the issue of, of migrant exploitation. Um, I mean, look, I, I, the government has a border reopening plan that would mean for most people, um, they may not necessarily be in until August at, at least, and they still want process Oh, sorry, they won't process new visas until um, August, my bad. Um, and that's that's kind of problematic because the visa processing and border reopening actually are two separate things. And so um, we continue pushing for outcomes for split migrant families by advocating for removal of the living together requirement, um, as well as just ensuring that um, border exemptions are dealt with in a way that upholds you know, the family's needs. So. Um, I also want to say that, you know, for those of you who would split migrant families, totally acknowledge that um, the stress of being in that situation may actually put you more at risk of exploitation. And so um, you can, you know, if you feel like your working conditions have deteriorated because of that, you can highlight that in your submission to the inquiry as well. Um, let me just scroll down because I think there's a few other comments. Um, I think that was into some repeat ones. Um, but just want to say that um, what I think, you know, why we keep talking about employer bound visas is that government officials themselves acknowledged in previous um, hearings that we've had with them that employer bound visas um, are a source of exploitation. And it's one of those weird things where we've got government um, officials admitting it and yet the rules haven't changed. And so this is why your voices will be so important um, in this inquiry, because I think it's time we have a bit of a shake up in that side of things on top of all the other stuff um, in terms of resourcing the labor inspectorate and um, holding employers um, to account as well. I knew, I just wanted to say, you know, especially since it's the beginning of the year, like what are some of the, you know, if you had a, a wish list of, of changes you would, you would want to to make um, to to address exploitation. Like, do you have any in mind that any any ideas that you may want to give potential submitters to think about on things you're fighting for at the moment? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think uh, the government seriously needs to consider just um, issuing open work visas. Uh, do not tie uh, migrant workers to employers. I mean, if if you really want to attach you know people could be attached to regions for example where we have a certain skill shortage uh, you know even that that's not ideal but it would be way better than what we have now uh, we, we can understand that you know the government is trying maybe trying to provide certainty to businesses so to, to you know taking that into account maybe we could tie people to um certain um, occupations or certain regions, but not definitely not tying them to employers. Um, and also uh, the, the government has this new initiative, which they think will um, eradicate exploitation, the um, uh, accredited employer work visa scheme that was supposed to come in November last year, but now it's been pushed back to middle of this year. Uh, so the essential skills work visa will, will stop, I think early July, and then the um, employer the accredited employer will come in but the our migrant workers will still be tied to their employers you know while they that may i don't know we weed out some of the the real bad apples in, in you know who are exploiting employers but the the risk of exploitation will still be there so the, the government seriously needs to reconsider that new scheme that they want to bring in uh, I think that they need to put a stop to that. And then the real solution here is to just issue open work visas. Uh, they, they can, yeah, then still be like one, two, three year or five years, but whatever the duration is according to the, um, the, the skill sets that are required in New Zealand. Um, and, and I suppose that that can't be established until the minister does his big immigration reset. So it's kind of all interlinked. It's, it's not just about 
migrant exploitation. And the, the, the other big one is, uh, you know, people who have been um, left out of the, the one-off residence visa 2021, you know, are, are we now going to create a, a class of migrant workers who will be super exploited? Because, you know, what, what are the pathways for those people who, who are left out? Are they going to have to now take to the, the uh, accredited employer work visa? Because they, they, they don't have a specific pathway to residence. They, they, they're not eligible for the one-off residence and the SMC remains shut. So what is going to happen to those people? Will, will they be our new exploited migrant workers? Um, so, you know, th th that's maybe slightly out of scope for, for this submission, mm -hmm. I don't know. But I, I, I'm sure, um, you know, we can kind of try to align and, and, and make it fit. But people who at, at the personal individual level, yes, please share your situations in the submissions, share your stories. I think that the more um, select committee members hear about that, the, you know, the more we can tell them how big, you know, what the scale of this, uh, this issue is. And, and um, also, yeah, and, and keep reiterating that there is a real shortage of resources. In, in, in various government departments. And, you know, it's, yeah, I, I think I, I don't have to keep going on about that. People who've, who've tried to seek help through those channels will, will know, you know, how long it takes. Mm -hmm. And even with the migrant exploitation visa that we have, when it first started out in July last year, it was great. People were, were, were getting results within days. And, you know, fast forward to now, uh, it can take, easily take a month for a person from the time they report their exploitation to actually getting a visa. Now, uh, a month may not seem a long time in the grand scheme of things, but for a person who is exploited and, and, and on the verge of, I, I hate to say this, ending it all and, and you know, having no income and reliant on charity, a month is a long, long time in, in that person's world. So yeah, I think that again, they, they need to uh, make things better there as well. Thank you, Anna. I, and, and aroha mai to some of the people who've actually put questions via the Q&A function. I've just actually, um, I've been looking at the chat. So I just wanted to briefly touch on a couple of those that are just about um, people stuck offshore. Um, just want to acknowledge that, you know, um, that's a situation that we're really advocating for around a, a pathway to come back and, and replacement visas. I think if you feel like maybe you're still being employed while you've been stuck offshore and that's caused um, tension with your employer, which has led to exploitation, I would you know tie it to that if you choose to make a submission. Um, and another um, question that came through was around um, someone feeling like colleges are failing students, um, but due to the sort of um, profit uh, motive of colleges that tend to hire and or tend to attract international students. Um, so I guess, um, yeah, if you feel like the educational institution you've studied in has done dodgy stuff that you feel has led to perhaps you being rewarded, um, you know, and, and, and taken advantage of, that is absolutely within the scope of the of the um, inquiry. So um, if you've got a really negative experience with a, a tertiary um, institution, by all means, do share it with the inquiry. I'm mindful that we're nearing the eight o'clock. Um, uh, yeah, just bench, uh, Mark. So I know, do you have any sort of closing remarks before I formally close the meeting? Um, just want to thank you again for organizing this session and all the, the people who have um, yeah, raised questions and, and, and commented in the chat. Thank you very much uh, for being strong enough and, and brave enough coming to this forum and, and raising those issues. And in terms of this one final point, um, so the worker who's exploited, if they've got family, they've got children, it, it has an effect on everybody. So I would suggest you mention the others as well that uh, your support network and your submissions, you know, the, the mental health is, is affected for the entire one, well, not, not just the worker themselves. And um, yeah, I, I'm, I hope you, you've all uh, gained some insights and, and, and you will all be making submissions for, for this upcoming um, policy. So yeah, thank you very much. And, and if anyone, um, I know one or two people mentioned their specific situations and 
uh, if you want to reach out to Migrant Workers Association for um, for help, you know, in, in case you felt that well, you didn't feel comfortable discussing it here, you can do. You know, we, we we're always available. You, you can get our email addresses from our Facebook page. So yeah, feel free to reach out if you need. Awesome. Thank you for your mahianu. And so it's a quick summary. Keep it. Keep your written submissions succinct if you can. Be really clear about the changes you would like to see at the beginning and the end. That's my sort of um, head tip advice. Um, make it really clear if you want to make it a private slash secret um, submission. Um, and do make it clear as well if you want to present orally to the committee. Um, really, really awesome to see some of the people who I've, I've gotten a chance to work with over the past few months here and, and a lot of mostly new faces. Um, I look forward to actually seeing some of you presenting to the committee and um, I'm, I'm not sure when we will be presenting a report on the inquiry yet back to the house. A lot of it will depend on the program this year as well as how many submissions we get, but um, the more submissions, the better. So do please share the submission link on your Facebook groups that you're in that maybe other migrants are in to encourage them to submit. Um, and we'll be hosting a few of those, um, these kind of uh, lives, uh, in the next few weeks, you've got until the 3rd of February to make a submission. So it's only about um, two and a half more weeks. So um, please make sure that you do um, put in your comments and your contributions. I'll close this off with um, uh, Fakatoki as well, um, which is Waiho ite toi poto, kawa ite toi roa. Let us keep, uh, let, it keep uh, let us keep close together, not far apart. Seems like I struggle more with the English <laughs> than the um, on that one. Um, Thank you again to everybody. Thank you. Um, hope you have a good evening. Thank you again, Anna, for your time and for the money Thank you. And the community. And I look forward to um, seeing you on the ground sometime soon, fighting for immigration issues. Kia ora. Kia ora.